Good morning. Oh, so good to see everybody. It, don't, don't laugh, don't laugh. If you don't laugh, the people online won't know, and they'll think they missed it. No. Good morning, everybody. We're so glad, wherever you are today, that you're, that you're here with us, whether in body or in spirit. We are excited to start, um, to start something new this year. A great rhythm of worship, a great way to say, hey, you have, well, some of you may have perfect attendance. Online people, you count too. We're so glad that you're joining us online. Wherever you are this morning, you are welcome in this place. This place is for all of us to have curiosities, questions, struggles, celebrations. All things are welcome here because all people are welcome here into full life in Jesus Christ. If this is your first time at Platte Woods, you picked a wild day to come. <laughs> we're, very, we're very glad that you did that. You're our special guest this morning. Um, whoever you are, scan the QR code at any point in the service today. You'll see a new, um, a new, uh, a new thing. It'll be a new page when you go when you click on the uh, on the QR code, and it's really slick and really fun, and it takes you to all the things that you need to know about the life of Platte Woods. Um, we love having all ages in worship, and I see baby carriers, and I see kids, and I see gray hair. And I see, <laughs> it's just, this is, this is what the life of the church is supposed to be. This is, what it lo- this is what it looks like. All ages in worship coming together. We join the rest of our country in celebrating the work and life of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. this weekend. This is an important time of the year for us to reorient ourselves towards the justice of Christ. Words you hear in prayers and other parts of worship today are drawn from King's words as well. Let's begin today with a little bit of prayer. God, we turn to you often as we seek through prayer to find the meaning of life. Sometimes it is passionate prayer in the midst of serious meditation, but more often it is a fleeting prayer on the run. We pray for patience when there are too many things to be done. We pray that you will awaken us to hear the cries of the lost, the disenfranchised, and the brokenhearted. Help us to redirect more of our resources to clothe the naked and feed the hungry. Mold us, O God, and open our hearts and minds to be willing vessels to your spirit in this time shared together. Amen. As you stand up today, take an extra second, walk around a little bit, make sure everybody feels seen this morning. If you're online, talk to the people around you. <laughs> talk to your family. <laughs> stand up. Join us, in, join us in a moment of welcome. Hi, church. Good morning. We're so glad you've come on this day that is frozen like Andy Reid's mustache. We hope that you find warmth in this place today. Let's sing together, Yahweh. 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 Will use your name. I don't want to take you in vain. Yahweh.
shall hear my cry, and joy shall fill my heart. Then I shall bow. fun to have music and worship together as a group, even if you're at home. The feeling of singing something, doing something together, is just really, really great and hard to match. As you join in a time of prayer, we join in a time of prayer today, take that same energy that we had with our singing and put it into your prayer. Look for a word or a sign from God today in these words that helps you to feel connected to the spirit and connected to this community, connected to creation. Let's pray together. May we dream of a world made new where together we shout for freedom And as one, we fight against all the things that hold us down and all the things that keep us broken apart. May we dream of a world made new where together we seek God wholly, helping helping all people experience full life together in Jesus. Christ. And as one, we sing God's praise. May we pray together the same. We climb God's mountain and as one, enter the promised land. May we dream of a world made new where together we proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God and that as one, we enjoy its peace and the abundant love of God. Holy and amazing Lord, you are with us in this place as we echo the words that your son taught us to pray. We say together, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, kids, I think you know what it's about. It is time to head out to your amazing small groups. We're so excited that you get to, you all get to do this. You know, a lot of your parents are in small groups, too. It's pretty cool. Some of them were in Sunday school classes. Oh, it's so much fun to have smaller groups where we can look at and explore this life together. And I'm just glad our kids get to experience that as well. Don't forget to scan into that QR code on the card and check in for worship and also see all the things that are coming up here at Flatwoods. We can't possibly tell you all the things that are about to come, but uh, but we would be here forever. But you can check out those, and I know there's going to be something that's going to be exactly for you coming up very soon. Let's continue now in worship together. Every battle, every heartbreak, through every circumstance, I believe that you are my fortress. 
You are my portion. You are my hiding place. I believe you are the way, the truth, the life. I believe you are the way, the truth, the life. I believe you ever. Good morning, church. Good morning to those who are here and present uh, who braved the, my, my, the air temperature on my car. Thermometer said negative nine when I got in this morning at 7.30. So for those who are here, good to see you. I thought I was hardcore too until I saw a young man walk by in shorts and a t-shirt going to his kid's small group. That's hardcore. Welcome to those as well joining online wherever you are today. 
Just a moment, I, I just want to take a moment the, to recognize and remember that tomorrow is January 15th, and 95 years ago, Martin Luther King Jr. was born in Atlanta, Georgia, a speaker and a teacher and a nonviolent leader of the civil rights movement here in the United States. His impact was unparalleled, and he is now recognized the world over and so every third Monday of the January of this month, we recognize it as Martin Luther King Jr. Day, and we celebrate it. Uh, it became a federal holiday. Maybe some know this. It became a federal holiday in 1983. It, uh, President Ronald Reagan signed it into existence, but it, wasn't first, it was first observed then in 1986, but this is a wild fact. It was not recognized in every state of the Union until the year 2000. There are, no doubt today, citizens and community leaders and elected officials and even we, the citizens, church congregations and pastors that far and wide recognize and celebrate Reverend Dr. King's contributions to our nation some 60 years after his passing. He was a radical, nonviolent revolutionary. Some would call him strange, uncanny, and even weird. He sought an end to racial segregation and discrimination, and we know this. He, he sought to and worked for, he favored labor unions. He worked for workers. He publicly sought an end to the systems and the policies that encouraged violence and combat and war, not just domestically, but abroad as well. And I think it's always interesting because when people ask where he got his ideas, he's a Christian pastor, y'all, right? Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. And it took decades for people of different ideologies and political parties and skin colors and re religious affiliations to, to recognize this contribution. Especially, I wanna make note of this, especially white Christians here in America. Because 60 years ago, the praise and the accolades and the celebration that we have today for this man were not recognized. It's important for us to remember and reflect upon that. He was... Martin Luther King Jr. was following Jesus' call to be a change agent in our world, to be radical and strange and awkward and weird because the world needs strange and radical and awkward and weird. And we're going to talk more about that today. This month in our January sermon series, we're looking to remove the filters that we have placed on other people and those filters that we have placed on ourselves, those filters that separate us from how God sees us, how God recognizes each and every one of us, how God sees us as our true selves. As Pastor Evie mentioned last week when she kicked off this sermon series, we each of us have a false self and a true self. And when we seek to see one another and ourselves as we truly are, as God sees us and knows us, we grow not just closer to God, but we grow closer to each other and closer to our true selves. That's a good thing. As challenging and as difficult and sometimes painful as that might be, that is a good thing, to see ourselves as our true selves with no filter. I'm Pastor Jess Horsley. I'm one of the associates here. I am glad, again, that you, for those present, brave the weather. For those online, wherever you are, I'm glad you're here as well. This, this is an important sermon series as we remove those filters from ourselves and others. Now, again, last week, Pastor Evie reminded us in our first week of the series that God sees us, God calls us redeemed. God calls you redeemed, redeemed from your mistakes, redeemed from your pain, and redeemed from your perceived weaknesses. We are redeemed. And this week, I'm here to tell you that God sees you, that God knows you as weird. Yeah, weird. I, mean, it's a, I don't think it's an accident that Pastor Evie asked me to preach on the weird week. Hear these words, the definition, the dictionary definition of weird, suggesting something supernatural, otherworldly, uncanny, like the X-Men, very strange or bizarre, inducing a sense of disbelief or alienation. 
And no, the word weird does not specifically show up in the original Hebrew or Greek in Scripture. And through translations, I've yet to find the word weird as a descriptor in Scripture. But there is no denying There is no denying that Jesus and his followers were and today are called to be weird. There there are certainly something otherworldly about Jesus, right? In the Gospel of John, chapter 15, Jesus, he comforts his followers and he says, if you belong to the world, the world would love you as its own. However, I have chosen you out of the world. You do not belong to this world, John 15, 19. And a few chapters later in John 18, after Jesus has been arrested and he's being accused of calling himself a king by Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor of Judea at the time, and Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest. But remember, Jesus is a nonviolent, radical revolutionary. Jesus says, but now my kingdom is from another place. John 18, 36. So Jesus and the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God are otherworldly, certainly. They are not of this world. And then we go back to the beginnings of the gospels. We get a foretaste of this weirdness from John the baptizer, okay? In the gospel of Luke, and this is important, okay? The gospel of Luke chapter three, Jesus's cousin, John the baptizer, he's living in the wilderness. He's eating bugs and wild honey. He's wearing camel hair and a leather loincloth. That is not weird at all. It was weird even at the time. And scripture says the people were filled with expectations. Everyone wondered whether John might be the Christ, the anointed one. And John replied to all of them, I baptize you with water, but the one who is more powerful than me is coming, and I am not worthy to loosen the straps on his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. So here is John the baptizer saying, I use water, that's normal for baptism. That's what we use, by the way. And then he says, but there's this one called Jesus, and He uses the Holy Spirit and fire to baptize. Even crazy John is saying Jesus is weird. And with his baptism, Jesus begins this weird ministry. In Mark 1 and Matthew 4 and Luke 5 and John 1, Jesus calls uneducated non-students to be his students, to be his followers. He calls fishermen and tax collectors and zealots and ordinary folks. And then in John 2, he turns water into wine. We sometimes forget that. The first sign of Jesus' divinity in the Gospel of John is turning water into wine, a miracle, but also an amazing party trick. In Matthew 9 and in Mark 2 and Luke 5 and 19, Jesus eats with tax collectors and with extortionists, according to custom, That's a big no-no. In Matthew 12 and Mark 2 and John 5 and in John 9, Jesus heals people specifically on the Sabbath day. Again, another religious no-no. You just don't do it. You're breaking social taboos here, Jesus. It's not okay. And then in Luke 6 and in Luke 7 and in Matthew 8, Jesus hangs out with society's rejects, the irreligious and even the blasphemers, prostitutes and Roman collaborators, and even Roman soldiers. Jesus hangs out with everybody. And he challenges not just the religious rules of the day, but rulers. He calls out the wealthy and the elite specifically in Luke 16 and Luke 12 and Luke 18 and Matthew 19 and Matthew 23. Over and over and over again, Jesus defies social norms, cultural expectations of what a teacher, a leader, a rabbi would have done. Where he goes, who he spends time with, what he says, it's just awkward, it's just strange. And Jesus does all of it, all of it with intention, with love and with hope. All right? He loves the people that he encounters, each and every one of them. No matter who they are, where they're from, what their background is, he loves them. He has genuine compassion for them. And he encounters them, he, he teaches with hope. Hope that those that he encounters 
will be set free. The good news is this freedom. Free from the filters, right? The filters that they have on other people, the filters that they have on themselves. Free from the shame and the guilt and the judgment that they feel, but also that they have for others. Free to follow Jesus. Free to follow him, to live like he lives. To live like Jesus, this anointed one, this Emmanuel, this God with us. Here is Jesus inviting people to be like him, to be the anointed one, to be God with us. Jesus invites all the world to know this new way of life, this new way of living. He reminds each and every one of us that we are loved and unique, that we too can be like him. And Perhaps the weirdest thing that Jesus does in the Gospels, he teaches, he preaches this sermon in which he challenges the entire order of the world in which we lead, in which we live, in which we know to exist. Here in this sermon, in this teaching, Jesus essentially contradicts much of what we know to be universal truths in the world, about the world about ourselves and each other, and even what we think we know or know about God and God's kingdom, right? We've, we've come to know this teaching, this preaching as the Sermon on the Mount. It's found in the Gospel of Matthew, chapters 5 through 7, and lots of sermons have been preached about this sermon in particular. For thousands of years, pastors and preachers and theologians and saints and academics and And even philosophers have spent time reading these words and studying them and trying to understand exactly what's going on here. Like, why and and what does it mean, right? How is it that Jesus is calling us to live like this and to love like this and to simply be like this, human, all right? The Sermon on the Mount kicks off with this section that's called the Beatitudes. Anybody heard of the Beatitudes? The blessings is what it means. In the common English Bible translation that we like to use here, this section is simply titled, Happy People. Hear these words. Happy are people who are hopeless, because the kingdom of heaven is theirs. And happy are people who grieve, because they will be made glad. Happy are people who are humble, because they will inherit the earth. And happy are people who are hungry and thirsty for righteousness because they will be fed until they are full. Happy are people who show mercy because they will receive mercy. And happy are people who have pure hearts because they will see God. Happy are people who make peace because they will be called God's children. And happy are people whose lives are harassed because they are righteous because the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Happy are you when people insult you and harass you and speak all kinds of bad and false things about you all because of me. Be full of joy and be glad because you have a great reward in heaven. In the same way, people harass the prophets who came before you. Okay, so... I don't know about you, but I remember hearing this passage when I was going through confirmation. I grew up United Methodist, and I remember hearing this when I was about 13 years old, eighth grade confirmation, and I paid attention really for the first time, right? I was like, what is this about? What's going on here? And it made no sense at all. Anybody else feel the same way? You read this passage, and you're like, but that doesn't click, right? How can anybody be happy when they're hopeless, Or how can they be happy when they're grieving? How can they be happy when they're humble? Being humble doesn't make sense in the noisy world in which we live, in which we're all on our social media all the time, seeing all the amazing things that everybody else is doing, right? And how can we be happy when oppression seems to run rampant, not just in our own culture, but all over the world? How can we be happy when justice just does not come. How are we supposed to be happy with mercy or peace? Seriously, I mean, think about that, right? We, we live in a world where escalating force, where violence is the solution to many of our problems. 
right? Not just political, but social as well. These, these blessings that we read that Jesus shares simply don't make sense. And I'll be honest, it's 30 years since I was in confirmation now, and I'm, I'm a pastor now, right? Like, I've been to seminary. I've been a, in full-time ministry for over a decade. I have read Scripture over and over, and I've sat with many of you and thousands of people over the last decade and had conversations like this. And, and, and honestly, it, these blessings still don't make sense. They don't. I mean, they don't track with the world in which we live today. Right? It, it doesn't make sense. And, and I, think, I think that's the point. I think that's the point that Jesus is trying to make here is that Jesus is saying the world is not the way it's supposed to be. I'm calling you to be weird, to be radical, to be ridiculous. I'm calling you, you, right, and you, you, you at home, you. Each and every one of us are called to be ridiculous and radical and weird. That's what we, as followers of Jesus, as the church, are supposed to be. The way that we live, the way that we forgive, the way that we hope, the way that we bear together with one another when someone is hurt or someone is hurting or someone is in pain, the way that we share what we have. I don't know if I'm supposed to announce this, but the, there's an update to the Christmas Eve giving. It's okay. I'm assuming it's okay I announced this. So we had giving that came in for the Christmas Eve, and we're over $91,000. Plotwoods Church, you are radical. It's spectacular. And that all goes, that all, that all leaves this building. That changes people's lives. That's radical. That's ridiculous. That's weird, right? That's extremely weird. It doesn't make sense. I mean, that's what, that's what, God's love looks like in action. When, I mean, you maybe hear me say this all the time, but God works on us and God works in us so that God can work through us, right? This divine love that we experience, that we receive, that Jesus says, give it away radically to everybody you meet. It doesn't matter where you are. Always and forever, just give the love away. Jesus invites us into this weirdness to be a part of something that is unique, that is different. Stanley Hauerwas is a, one of the most influential theologians of the modern age, and he says this, Jesus gathers people so that a society comes into being like no society the world has ever seen. It was a society which, counter to all precedent, was mixed in its composition, mixed racially, mixed religiously, mixed economically. When Jesus called his society together, us together, Jesus gave them, gave us, a new way to, of life to live. He gave them a new way to deal with offenders by forgiving them. A new way to deal with violence by suffering. A new way to deal with money by sharing it. A new way to deal with a corrupt society by building a new order, not smashing the old. Jesus gave them, us, a new pattern of relationships and which was made concrete, a radical new vision of what it means to be a human person. All right, I gotta ask, has anybody else seen the Barbie movie? All right, there's a few people. It is spectacular. I didn't know what to think going in. I mean, seriously, right? I mean, think about it. I, I watched it, I laughed out loud, and I cried multiple times. In the movie, right, there's this, there's this idea that Barbie and Ken travel from Barbie world to the real world and then back again to Barbie world, and things get pretty wild, pretty weird. And, and watching the movie, I thought of this passage from Peter's first letter to the church in Asia Minor. In 1 Peter, Jesus' followers are wondering what, what to do. They're, this is the new church, right? And so Peter writes these words. Dear friends, you are foreigners and strangers on this earth. I beg you not to surrender to those desires that fight against you. Always let others see you behaving properly, even though they may accuse you of doing wrong. Then when God comes, others will honor God by telling the good things that they saw you do. 
1 Peter 2, 11 and 12. Now, in the Barbie movie, there's one particular doll that stands out from the rest. Anybody guess which Barbie I'm going to say? Weird Barbie. Let's, let's take a look real quick. Hello? Hmm? Humans. Oh. We're fine. And Ellen. Mm. Come into my weird house. Hi. I'm Weird Barbie. I am in the splits. I have a funky haircut, and I smell like basement. Oh, my God. I had a weird Barbie. Yeah, you did. You make them weird by playing too hard. It's cool. Weird Barbie, right? I'm stuck in the splits, I have a weird haircut, and I smell like basement. Everybody had a weird Barbie, played amazingly by Kate McKinnon. Weird, weird Barbie in the film embodies every doll that all of us had, right? And I, went, I had a lot of babysitters. My parents both worked out of the home, and so I went to a lot of babysitters. I love the weird Barbie, right? I may have actually un unintentionally created a weird Barbie or two, they're the ones that have the buzz cut because you're playing with scissors that you're not supposed to be playing with, right? They're the hand-me-downs that got played with a little too hard, and so like they're stuck in awkward poses, and maybe an arm is missing or a head happens, right? They're not just unique or, or strange. They're, they're weird, right? You drew on their face, gave them tattoos. Who doesn't love tattooed Barbie? Just saying, just saying. In the Barbie movie, it's weird, Barbie, who is the mystic, the wise mentor, the teacher, the friend, both the guide and the giver. The guide and the giver. The one who helps reveal and redeem and remove the filters from the eyes of the other dolls and the other characters. And, spoiler alert, it's because of weird Barbie that Barbie world is saved. It's only... It's only because of Jesus and Jesus' way that our world will be saved. Well, it begins with Jesus, though. The invitation is made to you, and to you, and to you, and to you, and you at home, and each and every one of us, right? It's up to us to become weird in the world in which we live, to reclaim the weirdness of our faith, the faith that Jesus had, right, to renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness in our world, to reject the evil powers that are alive and at work in our world, to repent and transform and change, not just ourselves, but the world around us, to seek mercy and peace. And that sounds wild today. That sounds strange. That sounds uncanny. That sounds weird to be a peacemaker. Or to seek happiness and show joy and hope when we or others feel hopeless or lost or to find what it means to love. Love radically, to receive it and experience it, and then to give it away. And don't be too weird in the way you give love away, all right? Yeah, some of you know what I'm talking about. Some of you are huggers and some of you are not. Somebody tried to recently give me a hug, and I was like, oh, I don't know you that well, hi. <laughs> but welcome, because you are loved. You are loved. And you are called to give that love away. So may we as Christ followers do the unexpected, bring about God's vision of a weird world. May it be so. Will you pray with me? Good and gracious God, thank you for the weird way in which your son entered this world and lived his life in the way that he engaged with so many different people and showed and shared love and hope and peace and mercy and grace and compassion. Help us to be the same. Help us to leave this place, to know that, God, this place, this society that we have created, that you have created, God, that we are called to be about, that we are called to be a part, that we might be transformational in this world. And might it be because of your radical Weird love. Amen.
generosity, how we give, how Christ gives, it's a practice. Each and every one of us are called to practice. And just like working out, maybe that's one of your New Year's resolutions, but just like working out, it takes different kinds of actions, different kinds of muscles, heart muscles, mind muscles, to stay healthy. We hope that in this new year, in 2024, you might practice this muscle, what it means to be generous, what it means to give, to dig deeper into this community that is Platwood's church. One of our practices, again, is giving. So no matter who you are, your generosity matters. It's because of your weekly generosity that we are able to be radical, to be weird in our giving at Christmas. Your gen generosity supports transformational ministry, not just here at Platwoods Church, but throughout our community and the world. There are many different ways to give here at Platwoods Church. During the next song, I invite you and encourage you to consider how you might give, whether you're here in person or at home online. You can use Venmo to make a gift, you can text to give, or you can even drop off a physical gift here in the entryways. If you are new here, if you are a guest or a visitor, your presence here is a gift to this community, and we are grateful. I invite you to talk to Michael out in the gathering space after worship. During this next song, we hope that you might focus on what it means for you to give, to exercise that muscle that God has given you and listen to the Holy Spirit at light, alive and at work in your heart and in your mind. Let's sing. The sweetest frame, but holy trust in Jesus' name. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness.
the louder we clap, the more people they know we have here at home. <laughs> Please grab a seat really quick. Uh, again, uh, before you leave today, if you are, again, the next step, we invite you to take just a next step. If you are new, again, that might mean just coming back to worship. Come back next week and consider what we're going to be talking about in week three of No Filter. I, I also want to invite you into, there's an opportunity coming up here uh, this month. Our justice ministry team is going to be hosting an opportunity. We have a, another courageous conversation. We have people from our congregation who are going to be sharing their stories and perspectives on race. We host two evenings uh, on January 18th and January 25th at 7 p.m. right here in the worship center. I hope that you'll come and be a part of those courageous conversations. Engage in the dialogue Live into our values of what it means to have curiosity, to ask questions, to be courageous, and to create a sense of belonging. It is a good day, as cold as it is. Please rise and receive this blessing before you part. May we be a people that show our true selves. As we encounter others, might we be more curious? As we build spaces of belonging, may we be make more courageous inviting all people into full life together in Jesus Christ. Go in peace. Amen.